<laughs> Welcome to Vidivo, the event. I wish everything I have to say, relate, talk about, preach, share, inspire, was all happy, good news, things that will make you jump up and shout, oh boy, hallelujah, praise the Lord, excited about not only possibly your salvation, but the salvation of others around you, with you, or your generation, or the next, or the last generation. You see, what I'm going to be talking about is called the event. And the reason why we call it the event and not the rapture, because the event involves more than one thing happening. And it's not just about the rapture. You see, the event really is about Jesus, because Jesus came already. And Jesus is coming again. And if we were accurate, we'd have to say, if we believe in the quote-unquote fundamentalist Christian idea of the pre-tribulation, pre-wrath, whatever you want to call it, you know, na 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 rapture, or harpazo, the snatching away of believers. Now, other people are going to say the church, and I'm going to stop you right there and say, no, that's not what it says. So, there are times I'm going to purposefully offend some of you that are watching or listening because you think you know what you know. And if you watch enough of these videos, the event, you're going to find that you're not so confident or you're not so accurate about what you think you know as you may assume you know. Because I grew up in a time and a place where every little minutiae detail was examined all the way down to the jot and the tittle or the yod and the tittle in such a way that I wasn't quite the same as Chuck Missler but I do understand having sat at his feet on Monday night what Chuck Missler was all about and we do know that there was so much you could learn from that with which he was inspired by to take and apply to his study of not only prophecy but the scriptures, the Bible and Jesus. So being Jewish I might have a little different kind of intensity to it that maybe he didn't have or maybe he had more intensity as a Gentile than maybe say me. Who knows? We'll see, won't we? But the event, let's go back to where we are. Videvo is video devotionals. They're simply videos that were created by me and inspired by God to take the Word of God to the people of God by the Spirit of God, of the Word of God, Jesus, so that people would begin to realize that there's more to church than church. There's more to God than church. There's more to life than just being a Christian and going and having kids and multiplying and be fruitful. But that there was also a personal, dynamic, active relationship with God that not only could you have God in you, but you could hear God speak. That not only was it so crazy to think that God could speak audibly, but that it was in fact almost mandatory according to what the scripture says. That you are told that Jesus would speak and that his sheep would hear his voice. Not read the word and have it, oh, okay, well, because it's read and it's said, well, then, you know, it's kind of, yeah, you know, we heard. No. It says here, and it talks about with the ear. So, that being a whole different ballgame, you could go watch and see maybe 5,000 or however many thousands of videos there are out there of Vidivo about, you know, devotionals that are leading you with the purpose of developing a personal, interpersonal relationship with Jesus himself. That is what Vidivo was started as. And then Vidivo Church became an offshoot of that. Because it got big, and it got bigger, and it went all over the place. So, 
Vidivo, the event, is simply the topic of the event, which is Jesus, meaning that it starts with, because we're talking about in this Vidivo, the end at the beginning, we're talking about Jesus' second coming, but in relationship to the event called Harpazo in Greek. Not Sal in Hebrew. Didn't know that word, did you? Whoa, what was that? How do you spell that? What did you just say? Hebrew? You mean there's a word? Is, it, is, the, is, that, is that taking Harpazo and converting it into Hebrew? No. You see, rapture is not a Christian concept. It's like, I'm sorry, but you know, hey, if we Jews can have Ezekiel flying off in the sky in a fiery chariot, I got news for you. Harpazo ain't no big deal, baby, because you may have the idea of being snatched away, confused with being like elevated like a hot air balloon into the sky somehow. You know, there may be more to this event than meets the eye. And I got news for you, I'm probably going to provoke you and invoke within you some strong emotional response because there's been so much words put connected to scriptures that we call sometimes when you start with an idea and then you want to insert that inside the Word of God, tendentialism. It's a really fancy multi-dollar word that simply means starting with a premise and then making it fit into the Word of God. I got news for you. That's basically what systematic theology is. It's the study of God assuming that man can study God rather than God reveal himself. Because the predicate of systematic theology is that somehow you're going to be able to figure it out. No, you're not. You can't. Because God is greater than you are. And I so much bigger than I am. And so much wonderful than any of us could imagine. As a matter of fact, he is the epitome of love. Which is why he can't tolerate anything else but love in his presence. It's consumed. Because love is a consuming fire. Now, you may not think of it the same way. And you may say, God is a consuming fire. Well, I got news for you. You may want to rethink some of the words you're using here. You know, you may want to kind of work on this a little bit. There may be more challenging to you. Uh, theologically than you know especially since we're studying about the rapture and about what quote unquote most in America at one time 90% of people believed not only in the rapture which is hard to imagine 90% of Americans believed in the rapture well that's what the Pew research said so it makes you wonder if Pew stinks to high heaven or if it's true because I got news for you sometimes polls aren't what they are cracked up to be How'd Trump get elected? <laughs> really? So, let's get real and down to the nitty-gritty. If 90% of people believed in the rapture, well, they didn't believe in it because they knew Jesus. They believed in it because they read a book. And that was basically the, la the Left Behind series, you know, and kind of like um, all these different movies that came out, you know, Thief of the Night, you know, and some of those that were popular during a time when America was looking for its identity and losing itself in complexity of Yuppieville, which had grown out of the Jesus movement, into Yuppieville, into where do we go from here because we no longer, we accept that Jesus is coming, but we want to have babies. You know, that's what the Jesus freaks did. You know, we want to have babies and kids and send our kids to school and raise them up in a Christian world and we want to change the world, but we want to have our cake and eat it too. So... What you found in the Jesus movement was the hippies becoming Jesus freaks, so to speak, becoming religious institutions, becoming yuppies. And to this day, there's a whole lot of Calvary chapels that are yuppieville. You know, I mean, they're just flat out yuppies. I mean, you know, it's like, well, you know, let's be real. Come on. You know, they're not Gen Z's or whatever, but they are yuppies. You know, and a lot of music industry is that way. Kind of. Yuppish, you know, we want our music and fame and fortune too. Ooh, yeah, kind of gives me the goosebumps of chills up and down my spine. 
Where's Keith Green or some of the other martyrs along the way in Christian music that died that were anti that way? You know, that even gave up their quote unquote monies from albums to other things rather than receive it themselves. And you know Chris Mullins. Yeah. So Keith and Chris, they might have been the way to go because they may have been prophets of their generations. But being back to the end from the beginning. What are we talking about the end? What, what do we mean by the end? Well, we mean the end of the world. Okay, so we can pretty much have no doubt and no problem with saying that and we all know what we mean. The end of the world. Not. <laughs> Baby, it ain't never going to mean what you think it means because we are talking about human beings. You don't want it to end. You want it to keep on going. Well, you know, that's kind of the problem here, you know, is that we got, you know, the kind of end of all things, beginning of all things, uh, millennial, you know. I mean, when people talk about the end of the world, they're usually talking about the Great Tribulation period. They're talking about a time when God pours out His wrath upon the world. And as soon as I say pours out His wrath upon the world, then half of you just went into your pre-wrath, post-wrath, and no wrath, under wrath, come to wraps, wrap it all up. Because you're going to say, some of the Christians are going to say, well, God can't pour out His wrath upon the church because He said He wouldn't do that. Really? Tell Noah that. <laughs> I got news for you, baby. <laughs> You've got a long ways to go if you're trying to decide that the church doesn't get poured out upon if it's on the earth. And is there churches in heaven? Well, the Mormons think so. <laughs> are you a Mormon? Okay, well, then I understand what your problem is. But other than that, Christians who think somehow that there's a church in heaven have messed up. There's a bride in heaven, but there ain't no church. I'm sorry, it just doesn't cut it that way. There may be an angel standing over the church, you know, and that's kind of how God treats the church. It's like the church is for the earth, and the angel is to send to the earth to tell the people down there what's going on in their church, sort of. You know, angel means messenger, so you better understand that. You know, kind of, if you want to get the book of Revelation down, right? I'm out of Pepsi. <laughs> so, dealing with the end from the beginning, we're trying to find time in a way that makes sense from our perspective of how God's perspective is related to our perspective because we're the ones trapped by time and God doesn't deal the same way when he talks about time that you think he does. Because... We have people that say time is relative, the time can be bent, the time can be spent, the time can be visited in the past, that there's quantum time, there's quantum physics time, there's quantum mechanics of time. There's all these different, quote-unquote, theories about time. The only thing God ever said was that, hey, you know, I made the moon, the sun, the stars, and, you know, kind of put them in orbit, you know, and put them out there for times and seasons and... You know, kind of to keep track. That's about it. He didn't say it was bendable. He didn't say it was relatable in the way that we as scientists are trying to make it fit our quantum version of it or our atomic clock of it or our radioactive, you know, isotopic, you know, let's change time so that we fit our clocks better because they're not relative to the time that's being spent because gravity doesn't make time work the same way. Hmm. So how did God keep track of time? In the year that King Uzziah died. Oh. So, the year of King Uzziah dying would be that. Well, maybe events are what time is. Is time event-led or is it numerical? Because you see, we're going to find cultural standards are being weirded out. Cultural realities are being played with. The way we talk and walk and think are being changed. I mean, there was a time in America, there's that word time again, where if you started, you know, getting on a train at 6 a.m., believe it or not, in New York City, you could wind up in Boston at 6 a.m. Boston time. Because New York time and Boston time may have been on different times. Because there was no universal time for time with the railroad, until they decided that 
In order to keep track of time better, we need to have something that standardizes time to make it a standard that we can measure so that we can tell how long we've been on the train. Because there's no way we could get on the train to New York and wind up in Boston at 6 a.m. starting and 6 a.m. finishing. But back then, it could happen. Weird, huh? Go read about the railroad and time, and you'll find out all kinds of information you don't want to know. Because, see, here's the interesting thing about facts. On the one hand, and that's what you have to look at, but on the other hand, and you have to consider that, which means on both hands, it could be applied to today. What do you mean? Well, you know, we have Greenwich time. We have mountain time. We have universal you know, time back in Switzerland. We have the Pacific time, whatever, you know, someplace else time, you know. Does that mean the time changed? Or is it relative to the sunset or the sun moon and, the, you know, like the shadow was coming down on, a, you know, no sun, some sun, maybe some sun. You know. hmm. How does that apply to God outside of time? How does God apply himself into time? How do we get anywhere with any time when you start thinking of time? I mean, we got Jesus born somewhere between like zero time and 3 AD or BC or one of them, you know, it's either BC or AD or zero. Huh? Go read about that and that'll confuse you because we change time to fit Jesus time. So is Jesus time different than people time? Is man time different than your time? Is our time different than the end times? What time is times? And even in Daniel, he couldn't get it straight because he said times, times, time, times, time, you know, and three and a half times, time, you know, in the middle of, you know. So if you get into words, then you're really going to get confused in Hebrew because in Hebrew, yes, it applies in some ways, but then it can also apply in other ways, which could also be applicable to the setting of the ways that it's being used. And then at the same time, could be also more than what it says that it is when it was in the setting that it is. Really? Yeah, God did it all the time through scriptures. You just haven't figured that one out yet. And when you figure that one out, you're going to go, oh boy, I got a headache. Or you're going to realize that without the Spirit of God making it fit for you, where you are, as you are, the way you are right now, time ain't going to make no sense to you. Because you're not really working in time anyways. You're outside of time because you're living forever, but you just don't know that yet. Because your soul, so to speak, is going to go to hell or heaven, but it better be going to heaven because if it's going to hell, it's still a long time going on. But you think time is over because you died physically. But you didn't die. So that time physically may have stopped, but it didn't end for you. It may have ended for the people looking at you, but guess what? You're coming back, maybe in a thousand years, you know rain on earth. You're going to come back somehow and still be on the earth. So, did it end at the end of tribulation? Let's see. And then I will make a new heavens and a new earth. Wait a minute. Now, that's not at the tribulation. That's at the end of a thousand year reigns of Jesus coming back to rule and reign on the earth. And Jesus comes back, let's see, at, oh, the end of the great tribulation period, which was like seven years but then somewhere along the line, there's kind of like this event called the rapture. So, let me get this right. We got seven years, or we have a rapture, if you're like into the fundamentalists, you know, which is fine. You know, I'm not going to disagree with them. I'm not going to agree with them. I'm just going to say an event is going to happen at the beginning, sometime before or during or right at the start of, called the event not Sal in Hebrew, Harpazo. Then we got maybe about seven years, and I do believe myself personally, seven years, you know, approximate. You know, how do you know? Because by the time you're in the middle of those, by the time you're at the end of those three and a half years, you can't figure out time because everything's all messed up. You ain't got no clocks, you ain't got no sun, the moon, the stars, everything's changed. How do you reckon that time is kept? What do you mean by that? Go look and see when all the stars fall from heaven. Go look and see when the moon changes its orbit, you know, and turns to blood, you know. Go look and see when the sun increases its distance, or does it increase its distance, or just its heat. What happened? What happens when the mountains flee, and there are no mountains? 
Is that in there? <laughs> yeah. Even the Great Tribulation is all messed up from what people, because they want to make it man's perspective than God's directive. You see, when God directs time, it can change at any moment. A day can be a thousand years, really, because he could stop time from occurring and he could move the moon backwards and the sun backwards. And as a matter of fact, I think he already did it twice. Go figure it out. Yeah, backwards. So did he go backwards in time? Or did our measurement of time go backwards? See, that's where the theory of relativity and time being bent and light being bent and Einstein and Newton, as we're going to find out. Pardon the expression, they didn't F up, but they screwed up. Because it's our measurement of time that gets messed up, not the sequential order of events as they are going to occur in the time that they were already recorded in heaven and are already occurring when God says they occur. When God says, go get them, Jesus comes back and, or maybe his spirit or maybe his angels are sent to pick everybody up and give them a kind of a free ride or hold their hand and, you know, kind of like escort them into the clouds or escort them into heaven or escort them outward or upward or snatches them or violently snatches them off the earth and picks them up and carries them away. Oh, you thought you were going to float up on your own. Well, that's pretty egotistical. I'm going to be snatched up in the twinkling of an eye. Really? I thought it was you were changed in the twinkling of an eye. Well, I, yeah, I'm going to be changed, but I'm going to be snatched up. Well, does that change occur while you're standing on earth? Or does that change occur while you're standing in the air? Do you float up or do you go up? How do you get there? It might be the difference between saying rapture and saying not so, or saying harpazo. Harpazo, you're kind of like violently taken away. Oh, that means almost like Peter being snatched out of prison. You know, he was one minute, he's there, poof, next minute he's gone. You see, the perspective of the guards was that he disappeared. He's no longer there. The chains fell off. He vanished in the twinkling of an eye. Really? That's not the way I read it. Yeah, I know. It's not, is it? Hmm, I wonder why. Could it be? And it says that he walked through and he saw no one. And yet the guards are Roman guards. So, did they get, like, teleported out of nowhere? I mean, we hear about, well, you know, we had this disciple that was first over here in Joppa, and then all of a sudden, boom, he's over here in, like, running after the chariot. Teleported. Really? You think God does teleportation? Maybe there's another explanation. Differentiation of like you know, perspectives? Hmm, there could be a lot going on there you might not know about. Well, you know, I mean, you can't get too carried away. You know, you're, you're adding things in there. You're making things up. Well, really, I think Jesus, when he said that, you know, come to proclaim the captivity and set the captives free, and he stops at the comma. Can you kind of please let me know as a Jew, you know, you know, I understand yods and tittles, you know, because it's kind of like a yod and a tittle. You know, it's kind of like a marking here and a marking there. It kind of makes a different version of the word and the letter so that it fits the word, you know, and it kind of goes into like, you know, saying things, something slightly different if you put a yod there or a tittle there or whatever you may be doing with Hebrew, you know, kind of marks. So, when Jesus quotes the scripture, he stops at the comma and says, it's, it's fulfilled in you, but it's not about the saving of Israel from the coming destruction, which is the rest of the sentence with the period, but there's a comma. So a comma means a big gap of 1,000 or 2,223 years, more or less, three or four off by five, maybe even years, because we can't keep track of time accurately. And that's for a comma? Yeah, see, you got to kind of screw up your thinking if you're really trying to put everything into a box. This is how it happened this year, that year, 
Do you? In what perspective did you get that from? Is it all about America's time or is it Jewish time? Because even the months are wrong, you know, and the days are wrong. And, you know, we've got this 30 days for a month or do we have 60 days or do we have like 31 and 28 and we got to mix this up and then kind of make another one, you know, add another hour here, another day there and something else for time? Boy, time's confusing. You think that's bad? You should try to find out when the end of the world is. That's why we're beginning at the end with time and with the end of the world. Oh, you want to know what time? Oh, okay, I can take 2060. What? But that's not right. I'll be dead by then. Exactly. My point exactly. You got it. You're figuring it out now. You'll be dead. Uh-huh. Maybe. Sir Isaac Newton, God bless you. Screwed everybody up. Not only was he a genius, but he spent like, you know, 16 hour days, 18 hours studying, working these problems, coming up with, you know, like gravity and, and relativity and all kinds of weird things, you know, that was pre-Einstein. But came up with a lot of things that, you know, people say, well, it's pretty accurate, you know, and then they came up with Einstein. They said, well, now it's, you know, we'll, we'll go with Einstein's theory rather than your theory because we don't think that either theory, you know, might be right because we might go with biblical theory that might not be true for either one of them. Huh? Well, to put it bluntly, not only did Sir Isaac Newton get hit in the head with an apple, which is like the stupid story about gravity, but... We know he was a great man that helped us to discover calculus. He came up with a lot of other things. You could read about it. Go to, you know, your phone and hit, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, Wikipedia, you know, and they'll tell you all that stuff. But if you scroll down a little bit with his history, you know, and begin to examine some other things about Sir Isaac Newton, he was a Christian, or a religious man, we can say. And he read about the end of the world. And he believed in, you know, the tribulation, great tribulation period. As a matter of fact, these are some of the interesting things about what he actually did kind of believe in and kind of some of the things that he said, you know. It was like, um, let's see, uh, where can we go here? We're kind of doing this on the computer. I was looking at some other weird junk. It says, religious views of Sir Isaac Newton. And, let's see, in a manuscript Newton wrote in 1704, he describes his attempts to extract scientific information from the Bible. Missler! <laughs> he estimated that the world would end no earlier than 2060. What? 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 Well, 2060. Let's see, what will happen in 2069? A partial solar eclipse will occur on April 21st, 2069. The solar eclipse occurs with the moon, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? But anyways, that was just something to throw you off, you know, to mess you up. So 2060 is basically when Sir Isaac Newton believed the end of the world will come. Newton, who is also a theologian and an alchemist, predicted that the second coming of Christ would follow plagues and war and precede a 1,000 year reign by saints on earth, of which he would be one. The most definitive data he set for the apocalypse, which he scribbled on a scrap of paper, was 2060. So there you go. You want to know the end from the beginning? All the guys that have been playing around with the second coming of Christ, the ones that don't believe in the rapture, the ones that do believe in the rapture, the ones that don't believe in Harpazo, the ones that do believe in Harpazo, the ones that believe in Natsal, the ones that know Natsal, no matter who you are, somewhere you believed in the second coming of Christ because you know he's coming again. Wait a minute. That almost sounds depressing. Now, doesn't it? Well, if you were planning on being around for it, yeah. That'd be depressing. 2060. Let's see, this is the year 2023. I'm over 60 years old, 60 plus years, something, you know, somewhere around there, you know, more or less. Keep it in there somehow. That's, uh, let's see, 2060. 2060, that means it's about 37 years away. I 
I'd be a little long in the tooth. I'd be 97 years old by about that time, and I reckon I probably won't be here. <laughs> Who knows? When we get to that part of the event, Jews are used as a witness. We're used as historians. We're used to bear witness of the truth, of the facts. I don't mean Christians. I mean Jews, because, you know, we have... Look at all the historical records. Come on. Scriptures come from Jews. Let's be real. Jewish people were used and chosen for a particular purpose. What purpose? Not just to suffer, baby, but you know, to uh, ha, be a witness and witness of God, literally, to the world. That's what I believe. You know, it's like there's more to it than that. But, you know, that's a pretty good analogous amalgam of what God meant by calling us chosen. <laughs> Such a deal. Could you choose someone else for a while? Times of the Gentiles. Oy. So, we have now somebody from somewhere at some point in time that had an awful lot of scientific accurate background being a world-class theologian that back then they looked at him and probably thought, you're nuts because they thought yeah, when, we don't believe in 2060 because, you know, we're just ignorant, stupid people back us, back in those days. We were just like, you know, dark ages and we were just kind of stupid. We don't know how to build pyramids and we don't know how to do all these magnificent, marvelous works that to this day we still can't figure out completely how they did it because we have diesel. And satellites. And cell phones. Are we smarter than those people back then? Or are we still trying to figure out what they did and how they did it? There is a certain law of what they call thermodynamics. Now, I don't know if the law is true. Anytime you use the word law, I'm going to laugh at you. You know, because it's like, it means it's a theory. It doesn't mean it's fact. It just means that, well, we tried it 17,775 times and it's been true. And then how long comes 17,776 and they changed the law because they found out, oops, quick, change the law to fit. So the law of thermodynamics is everything's wearing down. Well, I kind of like the idea that man walked with God and talked with God here on the one hand and then on the other hand kind of went downhill slowly, 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 slowly until... By the time Jesus came, wasn't walking and talking with God anymore. 400 years of silence is what we talk about. Well, I don't know whether he was silent, because if you look at Jewish history, there's some things going on, you know. And I, you know, Tulia may have been right, but I think he, God was still talking to somebody. You know, he's not bored. Maybe he's talking to Mormons, you know, Lehi or Nevi or Moroni, I don't know. But when we get to the place of realizing mankind probably was a lot smarter than we give them credit for back then, then we have to start accepting certain realities that maybe we're not as smart as we think we are. And then it opens a door to us understanding that without there being a infusion of facts or knowledge or something more than our way of looking at systematic theology as a way of looking at it, um, Hebrew, we have like five different ways of looking at interpreting scriptures because you're interpreting it. You're not really accepting it face value. And then there's literalism where people say, well, they're literalists, but they aren't literalists because literally they would not take it literal because as soon as you do, you got to start thinking of things that, you know, with the parables, or, well, the parables were a story to illustrate a point. No, if you're taking a literal, then it's literal. If it's not literal, it ain't literal. I think it's literal, but that's okay. You know, I'm different than you. Because I really am a literalist. Whew. Boy, are we going to be in trouble if I am a literalist? Because, wow, how literal did you get? Well, I used to give up everything that I owned, you know, to follow Jesus. Everything. Oh my God, you're one of those. A Jesus freak. Jesus came into my life. 
Yeah, I was one of those. I still am, you know, baby, because we're still kicking it, you know. I get my socks blessed off every day because I go outside and I walk and talk with God. You know, but hey, that's between me and him. You ain't no part of it, baby. <laughs> I may pray for you, but God keep him far away. You know, that's what video's all about. You can stay far away and watch the videos instead. Please, might infect me with something you got. And I don't mean COVID. I mean stupidity. <laughs> so, being the end from the beginning, the end is 2060. I mean, you got to add a few years because you're going to talk about, well, there's 2060, that means there's 20, you know, 60 if that's the second coming of Christ. And somewhere, they like to add all these years for like, oh, well, then we've got, you know, this time period where Jesus has got to ride in. And then he's got to sit down on Jerusalem. Then he's got to talk to the elders. Then he's got to do this and sit down and have this conversation and this conference. And then they got to do this and then they got to do that. And then they got to be this and that and the other thing, you know. And then they go, so those are months, you know. And then we got to go into this, you know. And this could only happen during a certain holy day. And it's like, really? You're telling God what he has to do? How about we observe and then we tell? That which I've seen, that which I've heard, that which I've handled with my own hands. And that reality is why you can't put a eh on 2060. Because, yeah, I'm not going to go with, you know, like right now telling you that it, Jesus can't come at 2060. But I'm going to tell you that, you know, you could probably have a big time span before the second coming, somewhere in there with all the seven years. The seven years are going to happen, but there could still be like a rapture and then kind of like a time span. There could be some things going on. And you could have kind of like tribulation. And then you could have kind of like this and that and the other thing. And then finally get to the 2060 and the second coming. So, can Isaac Newton be right? Yeah, I think so. And he could be off a year or two and still be accurate. Because, you know, given that there's so many weird ways of keeping track of time... They could be off a few years, you know, I mean, you got to give the man some credit, you know. I mean, one to three years would be easy to blame on the Catholics for their way of keeping time or blame on the Gentiles for their way of trying to make Jews to keep track of time their way instead of the Hebrew way. Or like even worse, you know, trying to look at solar and figure out how the sun and the moon and the stars all go together. Because they're still not astronomically correct on a lot of things that they do and say and believe and apply. Ugh. And it used to be so easy when we had radioactive. Test the radioactive isotopes. How fast do they deteriorate? Well, it depends on whether or not you've got water over the earth or no water over the earth. If it's over the earth and it's blocking all the, you know, little neutrons going through and all the other kind of stuff going through, well, then guess what? Maybe it didn't deteriorate so fast. Oh, and God could create time-based, you know, creation with time elements in it already, couldn't he? Or did he? Will he? Has he? Is Genesis first? One, two, what? Anyways... You'll find that's interesting conversation. But we only wanted to talk about and get you to begin to understand the event in a way that presents more doubt than hard evidence for you to put a finger on. Because you can do the research and you're going to find that 2060 is a very solid date for the second coming of Christ. When I say Christ, I actually mean the second coming of the Moshiach, the second coming of Messiah. The second coming of he who is called Jesus of Nazareth, he who is the Son of God, is God, as God, and is one with the Father and the Spirit being Father, Son, and Spirit. That is a reality that no, you do not have a handle on. It's not a triangle and a circle. I'm sorry, it doesn't go like this and like this and equal and one and all the other junk. That's man's systematic box making where you want to put God in a box and put a name on God and make it part of what you can tell God he is. I got news for you. The skies open up and I see heaven. I'm going to answer whatever it is he's got to say because I'm going to go. Uh oh. And it destroys all your realities. And literally, in some ways, that is what happened to John. You know, on Patmos Island, when he had, in the body or out of the body, I don't know. You know, it was such an out-of-body experience. I was on heroin, or I was on morphine, or I was on, you know, some drug. You know, I just kind of like saw some cactus out here, or some mushrooms, I ate them. No, I'm sorry. Did he dream it? 
No. Did he see it? Or did he go there? You see, that's what's the interesting thing. Even now, they still argue about whether it was in the body or out, or whether, you know, like Paul going to heaven and being spoken to and, and talked about. See, Paul didn't give you a whole list of everything that went on with him either. He says, hey, I only know a man. I know not when. And, you know, and he talks about how he don't know, but he was given some stuff, you know, and told some stuff and then, you know, was back and doing his thing. Supernatural knowledge? Oh, yeah, I believe in it. When I got saved, I had some unbelievable knowledge of as soon as I got saved. No way I knew it because I was not raised in any religion, Jewish or otherwise, Christian or other. I had never read the Bible. How could I start quoting it? Word of knowledge? Well, yeah, okay, if you want to play with that game, sure. Well, the Spirit of God came in and you know did his thing. and just, you know I was kind of sitting in the back seat going, wow, look at that. My mouth is moving and I don't know who's doing it. But <laughs> it happens too, a lot. <laughs> but it's a wonderful feeling, but you know it's also kind of spooky. You know you're possessed, literally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And hey, with John, same thing. He got to heaven and didn't know what he saw. But you hear of all these other people. Oh man, I died and went to heaven. I wrote a book on it, and I saw all my loved ones, and Jesus was there. You know, and there's my loved one. There was John the Baptist. There was Paul. You know, Peter. You know, and Pearly Gates were there too. You know, we were all on this grassy plain. You know, we were walking along. We had white robes. We all had blonde hair, blue eyes. Right. Sure. You died and went to heaven. No man has ascended except the Son of God who has descended. But you're going to go ahead and tell me that the scriptures are wrong and your book is right, and I'm going to go ahead and buy it. I don't think so. And I got news for you. Out-of-body dead experiences are not real. Because bottom line is, no, when Jesus was talking about people that were dead, they were asleep as far as Jesus was concerned. They were not deaded like what people think of deaded as being, you're out of there and you're in here. You know, you're gone somewhere. You could be deceived easily, or you could be blessed to have seen something in the future, stepping out of the body, being into a time warp, so to speak, if you want to call it that, or a time, what do they call it, a hot tub time machine? Um, to the future where you see the millennial kingdom, you may have stepped out of your body and suddenly you're in the kingdom and you're like, look around, it's grass, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, there's no mountains, there's hills, there's, you know, a sea of glass, you know, well, guess what, that ain't heaven, baby, that's the millennial kingdom on earth. The kingdom of heaven comes to earth in some time, time in the future, the thousand year reign. So learn, because people get so excited about end times. They get whacked out. And that's why you see, even me, I look a little wacky, you know, with all my beard. You're going to see me shave soon, before spring. Well, it's sort of spring already. Shave all this off, cut all my hair off, because I got really long hair right now. You know, and I always do that every year, just kind of grow it all out. <laughs> You know, forget about it. Jewish, let me tie some tinsels, you know. Curly's, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, Such a deal. No, I'm not Muslim, Jewish. <laughs> Same thing, in a way, but not quite. Muhammad decided to copy the Jews, you know, so he said, Ah, we're going to put this in there, too, you know. If you got Moses, we got Muhammad. You know, all right, fine, whatever. You know, if it sounds the same and looks the same and smells the same, it's probably the same, or it's an imitation pretty close. Mormons did the same thing, and they were trying to make up their own version of the Bible for America. Oops, they screwed that one up. I remember when the Mormons used to say that they were Jews. Thirteenth tribe, until they came up with DNA. Well, maybe we need to revise that. Yeah, you think? They still got a temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> and they think they're going to, you know, a center, a quote, center for study. Okay, the, the, the Mormon Center, or the LDS Center, whatever they call it nowadays. They keep changing their names, so I don't know what they're going to be in the future. But when Sir Isaac Newton said 2060, I'm sure he ran into a lot of consternation, so he didn't really say it. He just went ahead and wrote it down. You know, he just said, hey, I worked all this out. These are the quatrains, well, quatrains, these are all the different things that... Can't happen then, can't happen this, can't happen that, can't happen that. And even now, we can't figure that out unless you know all of world history and you start looking at the Catholic Church and all the different popes and all the different things that went on. And he was basing it on his eyes seeing the world as it exists then and then writing it in that way to present to us the future end of all things. So he was right about 
you know, there's going to be, you know, the great famines and tribulations and all the world events and stuff like that happening before the second coming. And then the millennial, yeah, he had that down. So could he have the year down? You're not going to like it, but yeah, probably does. That kind of screws you up, doesn't it? Which is why we're studying the event. Because I'm not going to make you think that I'm convinced 2060 is the second coming of Christ. I don't know, you know. Um, I know that if I was sitting here, you know, in Magna, Utah, where I'm at, you know, and um, I've been to Israel, I lived in Israel for over a year, and, um, you know, I mean, I saw, I saw the Temple Institute where they build the new, the new future and coming temple. You know, we got to get all the instruments ready and we got to go, we got to go raise a bunch of red heifers so that we have the red heifers so that we could sanctify, you know, our ashes and burn them, you know, and then sanctify the ground and sanctify, you know, and every year they try to go up to the Temple Mount, you know, and try to make some portion that they figure has got to be the temple into, you know, the temple. And every year they get turned back so they go ahead and have this little ceremony down beside it for the tourists, you know, next to the temple, you know, where they're going to burn the red hatch of the red heifer and they're going to, you know, I don't know, part the Red Sea three times a day. I don't know, you know. <laughs> it's a tourist trap, you know. I mean, uh, Temple Institute, you know, go see it. You know, it's wonderful. Three times a day, you know. Pay your shekel or whatever it is. You know, but, it, you know, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. There's something's going to happen. You know, the oblation stops. Whatever the oblation is, you know, you could pray that it's not the temple being rebuilt, which I do, you know, because I don't think that they're going to offer sacrifices in the millennium either. But, you know, some people think that. But um, the millennium means thousand year reign. That during the thousand year reign, which Christ already died as the you know ultimate sacrifice for sin, but yeah, we're still going to have a temple so that we can have, watch somebody kill some animal so that they can sprinkle the blood on the altar so that Jesus died in vain. Does that screw up your prophecy studies? Because I always hear the same people that believe in rapture also believe in the temple being rebuilt and in the temple there's going to be all this you know like. Ooh, we get to see the Ark of the Covenant. Ooh, we get to see the heifer killed. Ooh, we get to see all these things slaughtered. <sighs> you know, cut them from ear to ear, you know, so they don't suffer. I don't think so. What if some animals said, Hey, wait a minute. Jesus died for my sins, or your sins, so you don't kill me. What if that animal, that red heifer, decided to tell you that and spoke? Don't be surprised. If it happened to Balaam, it could happen to you. There's more... You know, they say, like, in heaven and earth, and is thought of in your philosophy, you know, as an old quote. But I like to say, you don't know what you think you know, but what God knows is more than you know. And you know, you better figure it out, because you don't know what he might want you to know, unless you go and ask him to tell you. And that's why we have to do this with the event. We have to start this series at the end beginning at the end. There we go. We have to start the series beginning at the end because that's about the only solid piece of data I can give you that you didn't know, that you should have known, that you probably didn't know and you already rejected because it was so far in the future you didn't think that it was ever going to happen. I mean, there was a time when I was, to put it bluntly, I was living in Jerusalem at the turn of the century. Now that sounds really old if you say turn of the century. But if you say year 2000, it doesn't sound like that long ago, 20 years ago, some 23 years ago. I was there for the mo the millennial bug, you know. I was there when they were, oh, the world's going to end, you know, because we, you know, all the computers are going to crash, you know, and the world's coming to an end. And then the Antichrist will solve it, and the world leader will be there, and blah, 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 blah. Yada, 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 yada. You know. And I remember all of them. You know, I mean, I lived this stuff. You know, I mean, I've been telling people, no, it's not going to happen yet. No, it's going to happen in the future, future, future. Probability is like somewhere around the 20s, 2020s, you know. From that moment on, start thinking about it, you know, getting more prepared. Get out of debt, you know, get your house in order because you're probably not going to see much more going on, you know, maybe 10 years if you're at best, you know, maybe less. You know, and I may be wrong on that. I don't know. You know, I don't know when the rapture is. I, I can tell you we're going to get to that in the event, you know, and... I can tell you what I've always said in the past before the year 2000, which was like in 2022. Um, that's when you should start looking at um, the probability being like in the 70s or 80 percentile group. You know, that it's probable that the rapture could come during those years. From that moment on, there's a probability factor that increases with depending upon the world events, you know, falling into place that could happen. You know, and then we get stupid people adding things like, the Psalm 83 war, which is not a war. 
Psalm 83 does not describe a war. Psalm 83 describes a lamentation about the nations and it never happened. And then they already predicted that it was going to happen by the same guy that predicted that, you know, 9-11 was some kind of like a prophetic emblem was found at the, the, the dust settling and we found this, you know, like whatever emblem from God, you know, at the bottom of the skyscraper, you know. So now I'm a prophet because I'm Jewish, you know, and I'm a pastor, you know, but my flock is tiny, but now I'm the world... Wonderful watching everybody hearing what I have to say, so I think I'll tell you about the harbingers of the future. And the red moons. And the red heifers. And anything that sounds Jewish so that I could get you to buy my books and, you know, kind of support my lifestyle or ministry. Or is that what it is? You see, big money is in telling you it's over. Big money is in telling you, get ready. Big money is in having you prepare yourself for learning about all this stuff and then warning everybody because then you get to be like uh, some of the other people that ran up on cliffs or mountains or ran off and whatever did stupid because then you could act stupid, supposedly. But Occupy Till I Come wasn't quite the way Jesus meant it, the way some people have done in the fundamentalist Christian movement either or the Jesus freaks that became yuppies that became into whatever they're into now. Rather, the time of the Gentiles is coming to a close. That means that the Spirit of God, which caused in an outpouring upon the entire world, including Israel, let's be real, the Jesus movement was not an American phenomenon. We had things going on in the Jewish community in Israel that you don't seem to want to know about because you still don't ask and you still don't know and you still don't talk about. So, to you guys. Jews for Jesus was birthed in the Jesus movement. That's a big deal for Jews. Thousands of Jews have been saved since the birth of Jesus, Jews for Jesus. The Chosen People Ministries, which is not the Chosen the movie, but Chosen People Ministries is the name of the... It was originally called, I think, the Christian Jewish Alliance or Christian Jewish confederation or something, where back in the 1800s, a Orthodox Jew got saved. He found Jesus. Jesus spoke to him. Is that the Jesus movement? And he started the birth roots of the, what would future become Chosen People Ministries. And to this day, they still have his history and all that stuff, you know. And You know, it didn't turn into a big, giant Jesus movement, but guess what? Among Jews, that's a pretty important deal. Because at the same time, guess what happened? Jews, for the first time in over a thousand years, started leaving Europe and going to Israel, the land, Palestine, to buy property. Because Theodore Herzl, at that time, said, Today, I have to declare to you, we are a nation. Ooh. We are Israel. Ooh. And guess what? From that moment on, the nation began to become a nation. Oh, the Gentiles called it a nation in 1947 with the United Nations quote-unquote, becoming involved. But 120 years to the day from Theodore Herzl's declaration of we are Israel, 120 years. Remember that year. Remember those numbers. 120 years, 1967, Jerusalem became the eternal capital of Israel again. Wow. Wow. The Yom Kippur War, 120 years later. Oh, is that anything like with in the Old Testament where they built the wall and they then later became, you know, the city and then later became the temple and then later became the day Jesus rode in on a donkey? How many days? How many years? How many? Ooh, so numbers do mean something. Well, if you're Jewish and you're talking about Jewish events, maybe they do. But you see, people want to take this Jewish Messiah, this 
Son of God, the Jesus of Nazareth, the Yeshua Moshiach, and say, ah, the Christ will return in 2060. I have no problem with that. I think Messiah is going to come a little sooner, you know, save some of his people, you know, kind of get them out of the way or get them ready for the Millennial Kingdom. Maybe help teach them some things they don't know about the Scriptures. Because <laughs> I'm sure they don't know everything. I don't. But in the event that we were talking about the end for the beginning, the beginning of the end, we have to talk about something to start with. So we have to talk about the end because that's where after that, it gets really confusing in the Millennial Kingdom. When Jesus is ruling and reigning as the King of the Jews and the King of the world and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because there's so much that you may have been influenced by. And I'm not saying go out and become a Jew. No! Don't try to interpret Hebrew. There are so many black people right now denying their heritage and claiming to be, we're Hebrew, we're the Hebrews. They're not Jewish, but they claim to be. Or worse, you know, other people that are white that claim to be Jews, and other people, Mormons, you know, they claim they used to claim they don't claim it anymore. But so many people want to be Jewish. You don't want to be Jewish. You might have to stick around after the rapture. That's probably what's going to happen. So there, don't be a Jew. But during the times of the Gentiles, you know, you may have some real influences from Gentile culture that influences your perspective on understanding the signs of the times, understanding the way God speaks about time itself, the way God describes how he's coming, when he's coming, and who he's coming for. I mean, in the book of Revelation, it talks about who he's coming, how few people are going, how minuscule the number is, and yet we've got Christians thinking that the church is going to be raptured. The church. They don't mean like some. They mean all 90% of America at one time that was going to be raptured. Really? Anybody here, the sheep and the goats? Or even the wise virgins? <laughs> so, there's a blessing that is there in the book of Revelation about just reading it. So go read it. There's a blessing that's about studying it, which is, you know, there. There's actually kind of like a curse in knowing what it means because you might find out something you don't want to know. Like maybe Jews don't go. You know, oh, yeah, well, who knows? You know, we'll figure that one out when we get there. But part of this issue is that when you try to take it from only one camp, fundamentalist Christians, systematic theology, inductive Bible study, word studies, Hebrew, Greek, me, myself, and I. You're wrong. Always. I created for myself the, um, oh, what do we call it? Um, I can't, I'm trying to think of the word. It's an alternative to systematic theology and to what Jews do when they're interpreting scriptures. Because what it does, it takes what God says and says, let God reveal it. Let God, God speak for himself. God can tell us what this means. Because we literally have the Bible saying, you have no need, no need, nothing. I mean, it gets even worse than that when you really figure out how imperative it is. You have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit of God that dwells within you, He will reveal to you all things whatsoever I've taught you, but all things also. He's going to reveal things. He's going to teach you. He's going to reveal things. He's going to make you. He's going to change you. He's going to... The Spirit of God is supposed to be doing all that you're trying to intellectualize. So we call it um, integral specificity. I.S. Now, I kind of, because I'm living in a, you know, kind of a modern age, I kind of have to take the theological terms and make them into something that's edible for other people. So, integral specificity, the two words are I, S, which is always kind of interesting because if you ever say I am, then you're always kind of going, I am or I am, or I am, I am that I am. I will be what I'll be is what we say in Hebrew, but you Jews or you Americans like to say, I am that I am. Jews say, I will be what I'll be. Which one's right? They both are. That's really messed up, isn't it? So, in integral specificity, it is what it is, where it is, the way it is, and it can only be understood by who he is. 
That's what integral specificity is in a wrap way. Now, what it means literally is that just like the integers of a specific item can't be removed lest the item no longer be the item itself, but it's changed because it's no longer included in the specifics of what was the integral part of the integral specificity of it all, then likewise, you can't take anything out of or be a part of the entire Word of God because Jesus said, Lo, in the volume of the book it is written of me. All of it is who I am. I am the Word of God. I mean, you want to make it mystical? You could go into Kabbalah and look at what they say Torah is. And they got Torah floating in the air with, you know, little golden entrails and fiery words. Well, Jesus went worse than that. I'm Torah. I'm New Testament. I'm the prophets. I'm the law. Well, literally, if you think of it as it all came from God anyways, it is God. So guess what? Yeah, okay, we can do that. But physicality is what Gentiles do. Spirituality is what Hebrews used to do, meaning those Jews that were closer to God, that were walking with God, that became the sages of our tribes, of the children of Israel. They walked with God and spoke with God and then gave out what the people could deal with. For instance, 613 laws and then the rabbis making that up, you know, but, you know, interpreting it from what Moses said. So, yeah, I got news for you. If you think that we're weird with, you know, the Orthodox and the Ultra-Orthodox and the Hasidim and all the others and Satmires and all the other Jews, you guys aren't any different, Gentile. You know, you got your own weird, you know, systematic theology, and then you say this can't be this because this is this, and God won't do this because God only does what He says He did in the Word. And really, seriously, what is not included in the Word of God? I mean, when people tell me that God can't do anything unless He first reveals it to His prophets or whatever, and that God won't do anything that's not already written in the Word, what isn't written in the Word of God? Creation, decimation and a new heaven and a new earth. Somewhere between those three, you got every single cotton-picking thing ever invented or thought of or conceived of included. There. Written. So, he got that covered. So, when you think of the beginning of this at the end, you can't say it's the end. Because the thousand years will still come. And then, beyond that, I got news for you. Beyond the thousand years, it gets better. Because he says, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. So, how about this? Look up the word eternal life in Hebrew. I mean, you know, if you want to do a word study, I mean, I'll show you where my life went. I was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Go figure. And, um, you know, I've been going to Chuck Missler studies on Monday night. Let's see, Tuesdays I went to... I forget what was going on Tuesday night. So I went to Bible study on Tuesday nights. Wednesday nights I went to school the Bible while I was going, and then whatever else was going on. Wednesday night studies at different times, different places, different people. Believers meeting sometimes, you know, catch different studies on Wednesday night. Thursday nights I would go Thursday night in-depth study, and Thursday morning I would go to Romaine study in the morning. Fridays I'd go to the Friday night concerts, but in the daytime I went to something. I can't remember where. Maybe it was a... Maybe it was a Jewish Gentile Fellowship, I think. You know, I went on Fridays. And Saturdays, we went to something. I can't remember quite what it was. There was another Bible study going on on Saturday. Something kind of... wasn't. I didn't go to the baseball games and stuff that they had. Then Sundays, I would go to all three services because I was working for the Tape Lending Library, Calvary Chapel Tape Lending Library at the time. So I'd go to all three services on Sunday. Then I would go home catch a nap or whatever, you know, eat maybe or sleep or something, you know, and then Sunday night go, you know, for the service. And then do it all over again on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I went seven days a week to church. I was at church seven days a week. Yeah, really, seriously. I had no job. Didn't have much money either. <laughs> Living in my car, my Ford station wagon, you know, and when I broke the sway bar, then that was really interesting. <laughs> if you know what a 67 Ford station wagon is like without a sway bar, whoa, you know, but anyways... Eventually, I wound up with living with three Christian roommates. Um, one of them went to Calvary. The other two went to different churches. One of them, Assembly of God. Another one, something else. You know, and um, 
<laughs> the other one was kind of weird. He was, went to a different cavalry, but they were the ones that first started this whole idea that women had to wear dresses and men had to wear suits. How did that come out of a cavalry chapel? Well, anyways, they got over that eventually, or they got kicked out of cavalry. I don't know, one of the two. But... You know, I was there for a long time, you know, for about a year going to church, you know, seven days a week and doing volunteer work all the time. You know, I was working at the Cape Lending Library, Calvary Chapel, Cape Lending Library, so I'd listen to cassettes while I was in between all the other stuff. And I was walking in the spirit doing all kinds of really strange things that I didn't know what they were, but believe me, everybody else seemed to know. But, you know, okay, so it was kind of interesting. Um, interesting times. <laughs> Only for those times. Don't do that now. <laughs> But, um, woo, wee, wow, it was great. <laughs> Young again. Ah. <laughs> Jesus, 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 where's Jesus, Jesus? You know, something about that name. Remember? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> starting to fly back in time. But, because of that, there was a time where people were getting all excited at Calvary. They were buying this, this teacher center, you know, and they were going to start this, Retreats up in the mountains, you know, and have these college and career was going up to the, the retreat, you know, and high school ministry was going up. Well, there's one time where, you know, T. Thornton was doing, you know, college and just going to date me. T. Thornton, Rip Boyer, you know, kind of all these guys, you know, I mean, I know, I met them, you know, I'm kind of, I, you know, wave at them, you know, set up the chairs for them. You know, I knew them all, you know, met them all and stuff. So anyways... The two were combined, they were going up for a retreat, you know, I think it was a weekend retreat, I'm not sure how long it was, I think, yeah, it had to have been only a weekend. So, they were doing a retreat up at um, the conference center, which still wasn't, you know, like what it is now, or the teacher center, whatever it was, and um, I went up there, and everybody, you know, like in the morning devotional, you know, and then everybody after the morning devotional went outside to play volleyball, you know, they were playing volleyball games, and then they had all these hikes and trails and everything else. Where's the Jew? I was in the library. See, I was so poor. The only thing I had was barely a Bible. You know, I had my Bible, you know. I was like, remember I didn't work. I had my Bible, you know, and my Bible, you know. So I was always reading my Bible, you know. Then my roommates had Christian albums, so I was listening to every kind of, right, on Christian music all the time right then, you know, because I was like, wow, man, I'd put it on and put the headphones on and fall asleep in the living room. You know, because we lived down in Fountain Valley. Really nice apartment, or nice house. Swimming pool. Um, so anyways, uh, in the library. Strong's Concordance. They've got a Strong's Concordance. Look at this. Ooh, it's every word in the Bible. Every verse. Oh, look at the back. Oh, look, 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 look. It's Hebrew. Oh my God. Look at this, there's Greek. It's all Greek to me. But look at the Hebrew. Ooh, this is cool. I spent, oh, I don't know, seven hours doing my first word study ever. Because I was curious, you know, I kind of went. I'd already been thinking about this for a long time. I'd prayed to God and God didn't give me an answer. I said, well, you know, Lord, you know, this eternal life thing, you know, I said, I'm coming from a science fiction background. I read Isaac Asimov, and I read Heinlein, and I read Andre Norton, and I've had all the science fiction stuff in my head, God. So, you know, you can kind of talk to me about time, you know, but I don't understand this eternity. Couldn't you just, like, suck it up inside yourself, you know, and all of us are wiped out once we die, and that there really is no eternity, but that we feel like there's an eternity, because after all, we don't know any difference anyways, because our consciousness is gone, and so... You kind of like wiped us out by just making us back a part of yourself and that kind of like, you know, like inhaled breath and we're back to where we began with, you know, exhaled, you made us, inhaled, we're gone. So kind of like, couldn't that happen, you know, with this like eternity? Because I mean, come on now, God, you know, here I find the eternal hills and yet the same word used for eternal hills is used for eternal life. So how come, what's up with this? You know, I went, I don't understand this, God. Am I going to die? Yeah! Jesus! <laughs> I was serious. I had serious issues in my day. I went through every question you could imagine and a lot you've never thought to ask. And I yelled at God about them when I didn't like the answer. Out in parking lots. Serious. 
to this day, I still go out and well, I don't yell at him anymore. I kind of like, okay, Lord, what do you what do you got? What do you want? You know, <laughs> what are you doing? Well, what, what's the truth? Come on, you know. But anyways, and I get it, you know. But and he tells me, you know, I don't tell everybody, but you know, it's like be, him and I. Oh, okay, we're cool. So I'm really panicking over this. I'm reading these words, so I find the word eonio. And I'm kind of like, okay, eons. You know, it's like, well, eons, all right, fine. Then I get into the word in the same venue of what eternal life was, the way it was written in the Hebrew. Now, it's not written age life. It's not written eternal life like eternal hills. It's written ages to ages life. They shall have ages to ages life. So I went, well, now I understand where those um, dispensationalists get it from. <laughs> Whew, that's kind of weird. But, uh, you know, I kind of, over the years, with learning my own Jewish heritage, eventually, you know, I finally got into my own Jewish culture and heritage. But I began to learn about ages to ages. Now, that, what that meant was that there's this time frame that has to be called an age. You know, we call it the time of the Gentiles. Now, that's years, but that's not an age. An age is kind of like, you know, we could say the Bronze Age which is what science does, but it's not a biblical age. There are certain biblical ages. So there's an age that happens. But then you're given to be able to be in that age, but then you're also told that because there's this age, it begins and ends, then it goes to another age. Age to age to age to age to age to age to age. Because in the Hebrew, it's a never-ending repetition or conse conse consecutive continuity. So it's a consecutive continuity of ages. That means that I'm never going to be bored, which is what I drew from it. Oh, good! Ages to ages. That means there's something has to be something different happening in each one of those ages to make each age an age of itself and an entity unto itself. So it's separate from another one. So it could be like, we go through like, kind of like, oh, God, is that where, you know, like, reincarnation came from? Did they screw up ages to ages and invented reincarnation because they get reincarnated in each one of these ages, they think? And that they really just kind of like Satan, you know, kind of like deceived them and took them, you know, took the Bible and said, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to reincarnate, not go ages to ages eternal life, you know, or age to age life. You're going to reincarnate life. So, I don't know if that's true, but that was kind of what I came up with. God never answered me about if that how it happened, because He don't only tell me what how something happens or how some people get to where they believe in or what they believe in. But being Jewish, I can figure it out myself because I'm kind of logical. <laughs> I know how stupid people can be, my own people included. You should see how we came up with you know the Talmud. Oh my God, one man, please, he codified it. Are you serious? One person's opinion? That's all that all is? Ah, oh, oi. What else did he leave out? See, I'm always thinking that. What did he leave out? What did he forget? <laughs> so, I got my own opinion about a lot of things in Jewish culture, too. <laughs> well, ages to ages solved it for me. But I spent all that time until the night study in the library. And then when it came time to eat, you know, I went out and ate and then I went back to the study. And then later when, you know, whoever was the speaker that night, I went to that. And each time, I just went back to the library. I was always in the book. you know. And then finally, I got a chance to buy a strong concordance. So, if you ever looked around Calvary Chapel and you saw some guy wandering around with the Bible and this giant concordance, strong concordance, that was me. You know? That's what I used to carry around. For the first 20 years of my life, everywhere I went, I didn't just carry a Bible. I carried a Bible and a Strong's. Everywhere. And there was no doubt about it. Not a small one, but a big one, because the big ones were cheap. You know, you could get one for nine bucks, I think, a big one, not a paper one. Later, I wound up getting a paper one, which is kind of nice. Now I have collections, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, I finally use stores, you know. Back then, no. But, you know, I worked with Firefighters for Christ after a while, so, you know, you could hear the, you know, tapes, you know, that I could hear all those tapes, and I used to study those, and I used to study from the tape planning library. So anything that I didn't need in seven days a week of going to church, I had the tapes from whatever I didn't get. I could listen to them too in the middle of the night because sometimes the Calvary Chapel tape planning library would lock me into the tape planning library so I could spend all night fixing the tapes because believe me, we used to pass out a lot of tapes, hand them out. You know, cassette tapes in little baggies with your number on it. Some of you remember. <laughs> so that's how 
I came into being about realizing not only did I not know, not only did I not have a complete handle on it, but as I kept studying with Missler, I kept being presented with what he would say, you know, well, here's the references. Now you go do your homework and, you know, study. Well, I did. I went off on a tangent and there were about 12 of us out of Missler study. We kind of met in the early days of online, which now is called the dark web, but online um, um, built bulletin boards, you know, it was barely getting started, you know, bulletin boards are kind of like between universities, but I managed to get into this group that was kind of like about end times and there were about 12 of us that, you know, we all had studied, you know, quite a bit, you know, so we all kind of compared notes and most of us, you know, we didn't, you know, you didn't really, you know, weren't trying to convince each other, you're just trying to figure it out. And so, I think one of them was a watchman, somebody, you know, and he finally went over to Japan and, I mean, he got kind of big for a while, then kind of died out and then kind of went off the rails, you know. And that's what usually happened to most people that got into prophecy. I mean, even Chuck went off the rails, they say. I was up in Alaska at the time, so I don't know. I wasn't around Calvary at the time, but they say that he kind of went off the rails. That's when Calvary went through this big flip-flop, you know, and all this turmoil came in and kind of things went kind of off for a while. And then they suddenly had different kinds of Calvaries and different people doing different things again. And like in the 80s or something or, you know, 88 Reasons is coming in 80 or I don't know what it was. Something, you know. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, I only remember that. There were some nights with Chuck that you felt like the rapture was happening that night. <laughs> but the 12 of us, pretty much, you know, um, we all came to the conclusion that we had done a lot of groundwork for setting up these probabilities, you know, and we said, well, we use the word most likely, and later I learned in logic probability. So. We said it most likely that the Lord won't, you know, the rapture will not happen before the year 2000 and probably won't happen until sometime after the year 2000, at least 2015, 16, 17, maybe 2018. So that was kind of what we came up with in 1976. Think about that. About 1976. You know, maybe 77. Because, you know, after I'd left Calvary or I'd gotten wherever I was going or I was in the hospital or whatever I was doing, still was in touch with all the guys, you know. And so we didn't, like, stay in touch, like, daily. No, we just read each other's material. <laughs> Things we would post on the bulletin board that we had learned, you know, or that we had heard. So one guy came up with the 2020s, you know, 2020 even, you know, but he was the only one. And it took a long time before I came to, you know, like maybe 10 years later, I quit with the 2016 kind of thing, 2017, and finally went with my own personal timetables working it out. I said, well, it probably won't start. I said, things probably won't happen until like 2022. I, and we'll get into why I said that, you know, from my perspective back then and then how I changed it and where I'm at now as we proceed on the event. But... As it is today, while it is now, we're talking about 2060 as being the second coming of Christ. So you have to backtrack from there. And now we're going to go back to, you know, other things that these series of tapes called the event will discuss. You very much need to not do them consecutively in order, meaning that you don't want to take this tape which says, the title is, and it's the first one, the title is called um, The Beginning from the End, or something like that. The End from the Beginning? The End from the Beginning. The Beginning from the End. Yeah, The Beginning from the End, because that means that we're beginning something, but we're using the end at the beginning of it. See? So that's what the first one is. It was like an introduction. And I wanted to give you the end time. Now, we could obviously, we're going to do some more, that's going to talk about 2160 and then after that you know maybe 2160 whatever because you know at the end of the um, millennium Satan is given a time to you know deceive the nations you know or whatever he says deceive the people I forget what how it said it I you know I have to be careful with the words now because it's been a while since I've been just automatically on top of it but 
it says that he comes and he you know, has an opportunity to deceive those some of those that are in the millennium, and so they get deceived, you know, and then they revolt, I guess, and then boom, he wipes them out. You know, God wipes out Satan and everything. You know, starts a new heaven, new earth. So there's kind of we'll talk about that too in the millennium and all that other stuff. You know, when we get to those tastes, but read the titles. Don't go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, unless you're interested, because you know you might not be cognizant or coherent, or you might be totally offended. By something, you know, especially if we get into, you know, uh, details of the rapture. Because I'm sure people are all convinced that they're going to be snatched right out of their shoes. And they're going to leave them behind. All those shoes are going to be left there, you know. with That's the only evidence of where you are. Except for the scripture says where the carcass is, there the bodies are. I wonder what that meant. Ooh. Who knows? We'll see. Beginning from the end. Summation. Bringing it to a close, we are going to see, if you live that long, 2060, the second coming of Christ. Could it be that it's sooner than that for the event that is called the rapture, Harpazo? Yes. Anything that anybody tries to say about it being immediately this, that here's the rapture, then there's seven years, and then there's... There's uh, the second coming, and then there's millennial kingdom, and then there's this. That's dispensationalism. God isn't blocked out like that. You can already figure that one out pretty easily. There are some things that he comes in on, like a flood on the day, and a certain number of days, like when he rode into Jerusalem. Some things are fulfilled to the day, you know, or the we should say the... They are fulfilled to the accuracy of two or three stars seen in the heavens on that watchman standing on the walls of Jerusalem as it is recorded in the scripture according to the prophecy that was given to those prophets at that time by God himself and the Spirit of God making it real for them to be able to see it with their eyes so that they could say it witness has happened of that time being that the people that were in Jerusalem could be standing in the gate seeing this man ride in on a donkey declared as the Messiah with their clothes being thrown down and their prayer shawls and everything and it being a fulfillment of prophecy exactly as God said because otherwise it didn't make any sense why that was happening why would he ride a donkey of all things wouldn't Balaam you know but there's a lot more that applies also as far as similes and metaphors of what he was doing which is really kind of cool when you get into the obscurities of the event as well as the event itself. And that's why we call this the event. Because yes, the overall event is Jesus. You know, his manifestations of his returning as taking us in what some call the rapture, which I believe will be by angels, but he, some people believe Jesus, you know, just stands there and goes, knock, knock, come on in, you know, or come on up. You know, I'm more like, knock, knock, and an angel knocks at your door, you know, and you open the door, and an angel says, come on, just like he did with, um, with, uh, Lot, you know, was living in the city, you know, and angels come up, to, hey, we can't do anything until you get out of here, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, we gotta go, we gotta go, it's time to go, you know, and they stalled, <laughs> goes to the show, time frame, you know, that was judgment, and it got stalled, they had to get him out of there, kind of interesting, think about that for a while, on the rapture. So, that might offend you. So, you know, we're, we're trying to get to the place of all that the event means is simply something happening. Salvation is the event. Jesus, his revelation of himself in whatever way, whether it be the rapture or the first coming or the second, is the event. Everything really is the event because it's something happening. That's what the event means. Something is happening. And that's how time is kept by way of an event, as far as the way God keeps time, not the way we keep time. He kind of keeps time, they say, days and seven days, but you know what? You know, without the stars in the sky and the sun, and the, you know, kind of going up and down, how do you keep track of a day? Well, is it 24 hours, or is it a circular rotation, or is it just it wasn't created yet? Figure that one out in Hebrew, you know, or in the story of creation. 
I did, but you know, we're not going to go there because even the rabbis were arguing about that one. They rabbi, they argue about everything, you know. When we say argue, we're really discussing it because we come up with all these different theories and then we prove them and then disprove them and then prove them again and disprove them and finally get to what we say. Okay, we got it. That's what we think, according to Rabbi So-and-so. <laughs> so just so you know, it isn't going to harm your salvation by studying how to make application of the realization of Jesus giving you warning to be prepared for him coming again either soon, very soon, or later. Because the other part of the event is something that is what I call the rapture. You die. You're raptured. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The believer, boom. You close your eyes, you're out of here. You got raptured. Oh, you know, you may have left the body behind, but guess what? You jumped into your new body, sort of. You're not sitting around waiting for, you know, the rapture to happen, because guess what? You stepped out of time from today to whenever that is, and whenever is, then everyone at the same time that you died got there at the same time. The dead in Christ shall rise, and then those that are in Christ shall rise, and blah, 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 and they'll all rise. So, maybe you may not understand what I'm saying. Maybe you're kind of getting an inkling like, ooh, that's kind of a different way of looking at it. Yeah, maybe it all fits. And here's the part about the event that you have to realize about God. When it all fits, all of it, not one piece is left out, you're on the right track. Because he could still change it. But, and it still make it fit. But it has to all fit when I can find what you forgot and didn't include in your rapture or your harpazo or your natsal or your second coming or 2060 and you can't include it in your theory, then it doesn't fit. It's not true. The same thing about quantum physics, quantum theories, quantum mechanics, about time, about life, about what you think you know that you don't know about Scripture. If I can find a contradiction in what you have said, then it isn't right. So why do I have to be the one to find the contradiction? You can. I did. I found it in every pastor I've ever listened to, and I went back to God and said, okay, what? And God finally, you know, I realized this, and this is something that you'll, maybe you'll accept this, and maybe you'll understand grace and mercy better, but maybe you won't. Maybe you'll have to deal with it. I did, and for a long time I thought, you know, they're all screwed up. God can make someone wrong for His will to be accomplished to make them right. What? Yeah. You know, you think we know the will of God. You know, well, you know, this guy's got a mega ministry, you know, and it's going on. Well, maybe he needs that mega ministry to be saved. Maybe none of those people mean that much, but guess what? God wants to save that guy, so he gave him a whole big of thousands of people to hang around him just so that one guy could be saved. That's not fair. Whoa. Are you big enough, God, to be inside of everyone all at the same time doing everything you want to do according to your will any way that you want to choose to use it? Well, yeah. Then guess what? There could be a mega church just for the pastor only. There could be a ministry for the minister only. There could be a minister for all the people only and not the minister. The guy could be totally whacked, but everybody else is saved. Right, fair. <laughs> It's the way God works. Thy will be done. King Saul is a perfect example. Were there people saved under King Saul? David. Were there people saved when King Saul was screwing up? David. Were there people that were still following God even though King Saul was a mess? The prophet and King David. And, David. and so was God still doing stuff? Yeah. So God allowed the people to choose Saul, but Saul was not saved. If you tell me that Saul went to heaven, I'm going to begin to wonder about you. You know, it's possible because you know, before Jesus, 
Jesus still had a chance to preach to him, so, yeah, you know. I don't want to say anybody went to hell before Jesus, but, you know, since Jesus, oh yeah, a lot of people went straight to hell. They didn't have Pasco with no Sheol sitting around going, well, we're the chosen, so we're going to sit around here waiting until we see the Messiah. <laughs> uh, you know, Saul might be in heaven, might not, you know. You better be careful, you know. Yeah, you know. David, yeah, no problem. He's a screw up. Yeah, he went to heaven. Screwed up, but still, he got saved. Yep, he did. Uh huh. So, it can be that you're learning things and you may have been wrong, but that's not going to stop God from saving you or making himself reveal to you who he is and how he is and what he is. Because he wants you to know him. Jesus said that this really is the reason why I came, because I came to, you know, save them, to you know, bring them eternal life, you know, abundant life, blah, blah, yada, yada, yada. But really, to know me, Jesus, and to know him who sent me. No, not like understand, not like preach at or tell or theology, theologically predicate all your statements that, you know, well, we're studying God, so this is what God does. No, to know him. That meant intimately, personally, to have a personal relationship with God Almighty, the Holy God, with His Son, Jesus, you know, Son of Man, ah, buddy, Son of God, Holy, and the Spirit of God, Holy Ghost, whoa, that's sacrilegious, yeah, I hope so, because I'm not religious, <laughs> I hope I can be just as sacrilegious and still walking and talking with God as I can be, you see, so the event, Right now, it's about you finding, learning, and applying what you've heard, what you've seen, and now what you can go study on your own, which would be with your own hands, learning what Jesus wants you to know about his event.